Dude, it's such a. Oh, that, I like. I genuinely can't watch that part. I could probably watch that movie again. I cannot watch that part. Yeah. I couldn't watch it the first time I saw it. It's just no one, no one knew. Yeah. No one knew any better. No one knew what he was doing, and that it was all a joke. And Good morning. It's so good to see you all this morning. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord together? It is. Well, as hopefully you know, my name is Sarah. And myself, along with Anita Barron, we team up to lead and guide and dream up things to do with the uh, ministry team of the neighborhood, caring for our neighborhood and how we can show up and how we can serve the people uh, around us. We wanted to come and give you a few announcements. We have a lot that's coming up in the next few months, several different opportunities for us to worship together, serve together, and then find ourselves changed. Anita and I were talking a lot about how our hope and dream for our congregation this holiday season is for us to be filled with joy. And we found it fitting that you can kind of break that apart, that we worship Jesus, we um, serve others, and then we find you yourself have been changed by that. So a couple of things that I hope that you will start to be on the lookout for and also start to pray and prepare your heart to be a part of. The first one happens this week, our Halloween break station. It's one of the things that is most well known uh, about our congregation and our church in, in this season, kind of kicking off this holiday season. If you can be here on Thursday, yep, that's Halloween. Um, not only just to serve food, but to talk with parents, to ooh and ah over children's costumes, to ask them what they're dressed up like. In these relational encounters is where we really uh, create and develop, um, yeah, special ties in the neighborhood where people know when they come to a coffee and donut drive through to ask specifically for the prayer lady, <laughs> right? And so we want to develop more relationships like that. Uh, a couple of things that we will talk about more you'll see uh, as we send out emails and whatnot just to make you aware of and again to be praying over. We're going to be partnering with uh, Creve Hall Elementary just right here next to us in two different ways. One is more immediate than the other, but the first one is they have lost their funding to ensure that kids who are at risk are fed over the weekend. And so we, along with a couple of other churches in the, the neighborhood, are going to take one week a month from here until the end of the school year to serve about 60 students who need to have food um, sent home with them to ensure that they eat over the weekend. So we'll be doing some food drives to make sure that we can supply food for those uh, who are in need. We're also going to be working with Creep Hall Elementary to do Angel Tree this year. Uh, we want to make sure that kiddos have 
special gifts when they wake up on Christmas morning. Uh, we're going to have some fun fellowships to do that together, uh, but keep your eye out for that. And then we're going to be working with Norman Binkley Elementary to make sure approximately 20 families um, have a Thanksgiving meal. And so we're going to create some Thanksgiving boxes, deliver those, bless these families, and yeah, hopefully create some fun community while we do that. All right. If you are visiting with us, my name is Ray. I'm so glad that you're here, honored that you're here worshiping with us. Honored those of you who are turned in online as well. Uh, if you are visiting with us, there should be a card in the pew rack in front of you that says we're glad you're here. And we are, we're glad you're here. If you do us a favor and fill that out, and I would love the chance to get to know you after the service. Uh, in the back left as you exit, we have something called the Pastor's Corner. And I would love to get a chance to get to know you and to give you a gift on behalf of our church. Uh, in November, November the 10th, is that right? November the 10th? Yes. Uh, we are having a family advent event. Family advent event. Uh, it's in our fellowship hall from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, my family signed up for it. I hope that you can make it. I think we have 25 spots that are, that are available. I don't know how many are left right now. 13 spots left, so they're going fast. And so if you want to uh, create some family memories, uh, sign up for it uh, through Realm. Uh, sign up for it through Realm. Then this coming Saturday, y'all, fall back. So make sure you, you do your fall back next Saturday uh, coming up before we have church next week. And then uh, we are also taking up relief collections for uh, the hurricane uh, disaster relief in eastern Tennessee and western North Carolina. Uh, people are in need of coats and gloves and scarves, uh, diapers and wipes as they head into kind of these winter months. And so there are bins. Uh, I believe there's some downstairs by the elevator. I believe there's some in the CRC across the way. Uh, there may be one in the back. I'm not quite sure if there's one in the back. Yeah, there is. There's one in the back as well. Uh, and so if you want to give, donate to that uh, new or gently used key word there, gently used uh, on, on the donations. Well, to all of you who are weary and need rest, to all of you who are lonely and need friends, to all of you who sin and need a savior, to all of you who are broken hearted and need compassion, our church, we open wide our doors for you here today. We've been in this series, this is our last week in this series on the fruit of the Spirit. So this is the last time we'll be praying this prayer out loud in this series uh, together. So, But would you join me in prayer as we pray our fruit of the Spirit prayer? Heavenly Father, I pray that this day I may live in your presence and please you more and more. Lord Jesus, I pray that this day I may take up my cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen. Let's continue in that spirit of prayer right now. As you've heard this morning, there are a lot of needs around in our community a lot of needs around in our state. Pray for those. Pray that God would open our eyes for opportunities to be his hands and feet. Maybe you come in this Sunday weary and broken. Maybe you got some life stressors on you. Maybe you're struggling with a sin. Spend some time in confession. God is faithful and just to forgive our sins. He asks us to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us.
And now let us pray as our Lord has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand in honor of God's word? I'm reading Psalms 141, 1 through 4 from the message. God, come close. Come quickly. Open your ears. It's my voice you're hearing. Treat my prayer as sweet incense rising. My raised hands are my evening prayers. Post a guard at my mouth, God. Set a watch at the door of my lips. Don't let me so much as dream of evil or thoughtlessly fall into bad company. And these people who only do wrong, don't let them lure me with their sweet talk. Good morning, church. I'm not sure what kind of week you've had, but I know God's been with you in your week. So why don't we stand and worship from wherever we are this morning. If you want to raise your hands, raise them up. Sing it out. Just be where you are today. together for God so loved.
God, thank you that you love us so well. Thank you that no matter what kind of week we've had, no matter how many moments we wish we could redo, you are with us through it all. You are with us now. You only ever always love us. Thank you for meeting us in our worship here this morning. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Sing it out now. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only name who could ever say. Jesus, the word, you know it, yeah. <laughs> we live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your love and lead me in your love to those around me. Come on, let's raise our voice this morning. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Thank you for this time. We worship you in spirit and truth. Amen. You can have a seat. All right, guys. Well, 
Well, good morning, boys and girls. It's good to see you all here this morning. Have you all had a good day so far? Yeah? Yeah. You know, in big church, we've been talking about something called the fruit of the Spirit. Does anybody remember the fruit of the Spirit? Do you all remember him? Can you think you could do it? Oh, yeah. Way to go. That was awesome. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do any of y'all ever have a hard time with one of those? Mm, yeah. Which one do you think? Hmm. This is confession time. Yeah. Patience. Yeah. Patience is really hard. Yeah. What about you? Waiting, yeah, self-control, yeah, yeah. Self-control, yeah. I have a hard time with self-control. Did y'all know that? Now, what do y'all think self-control is? What do you think that means? Anybody want to guess? Yeah. Uh, patience, yeah, it involves patience. What else do you think it means? Waiting, yeah, it could be waiting. So, like, maybe your parents have made some cookies, and they told you you have to wait till after dinner to eat the cookies, but you have to do what? You have to, you smell those cookies. And you're like, could I just have a taste? And your mom's like, no, you have to wait till after dinner. Is that hard to do that? Yeah, it's kind of hard to control ourselves. Actually, self-control is the most human of the fruit of the Spirit. See, you know, God, God doesn't need self-control. God is free and God's not tempted in the same way that we are. So this is, this is something that we have to learn uh, to be self-controlled. But here's some good things about it. There are things that you can do to learn how to do self-control. Can I tell you about it? One is, you want to say, holy habit. How many of y'all brush your teeth every day? Only half of you. Okay. Um, um, so if you brush your teeth every day, you know one thing you could do while you're brushing your teeth? You can pray. How many of y'all drink water every day? All of y'all drink water every day? Oh, you know what you can do while you're drinking water? You can thank God for being, the, uh, for being our water, uh, for being our, for our source of life. There are different things that you can do that what they're doing is you're pledging God's presence in your life all the time and that you live your life in God's presence. You know what happens when you live your life in God's presence? You start acting more like God. Let's pray, guys. Jesus, I thank you for this. I thank you for the challenge of self-control. That in some ways it is a gift of your spirit, but in other ways, God, it's something that we have to develop in our life. And God, I pray that you would give these kids the spirit of courage, passion, and of self-control and following after you in your will. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song song by flaming tongues above here's the mountain fixed upon it mount of god's redeeming love hallelujah king forever i will never stop my praise hallelujah i will shout Sing about it every day. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to. Stop. 
If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of Galatians. book of Galatians will be in chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and we'll start in verse 22. One last time. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh or the sinful nature with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with, with the Spirit. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Would you join me in prayer? God, open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive a word from you. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and redeemer. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. It's our last week in the fruit of the Spirit, and it's the one I struggle with the most, y'all. Self-control, self-discipline uh, is another way that's translated within, within the scriptures itself. And so when, as I was thinking about this, I, think, I thought about, well, who do we celebrate that's really disciplined? Uh, who do we celebrate uh, in, our, in our culture that's really disciplined? And a lot of times it's like athletes and business leaders, isn't it? Uh, I think about Steph Curry at the Olympics. How many of y'all watch Steph Curry at the Olympics? Oh, my gosh. Was that not amazing? And what did that come from? It come from hours and hours of repetition and muscle memory. And it's just uh, just an amazing display of athleticism. Tom Brady is aging backwards. I don't understand it. Um, uh, he was another one that you looked at and go, wow, look at that guy's work ethic. Look at that guy's discipline. Unbelievable. Um, it, you know, or, or you think about, I know there's some Alabama fans in here who miss him dearly. But you think about Nick Saban. <laughs> Uh, in the process, and um, I, although I got to say, I really love Nick Saban on college game day. Uh, he's been really, really good. But then as I thought about that, though, I thought about why do we, why do we extol these people? Well, it's because they're heroes. It's because they're successful. It's because they, they extol whatever kind of 
goodness that our culture wants to put out, right? This is, this is what we celebrate. This excellence is what we celebrate. And I thought about it. Well, I think Paul had a different aim here with self-control. Because Paul isn't preparing us to be heroes. Paul isn't preparing us necessarily to even be successful within the world's eyes, is he? Paul is trying to get us ready to be citizens within the kingdom of God. And self-control forms the foundation by which the Spirit produces its fruit in our lives. Say that again. Self-control forms the foundation by which the Spirit produces its fruit in our lives. It's really interesting. When you go and read Greek philosophy, which I know all of you did this week, Greek philosophers will have virtue lists, is what they call them, very similar lists here that Paul uh, lists. And what they do is that the first virtue they list is the supreme virtue, and the last virtue they list is the foundational virtue. So if you're looking at it through Paul's eyes, love is the supreme fruit of the Spirit. And that makes sense because God is love, right? And everything, action that flows from God is love. And so if we are following God, we've got God indwelling in us, then what's supreme? Love is supreme. That'd make a good song. But then the last one would be the foundational one. Socrates agrees. This is what Socrates, Greek philosopher Socrates, he said, For every man shall hold self-control as the foundation of all virtue, and first lay this foundation in his very soul. For who without self-control can learn any good or practice it worthily? I think Paul's probably nodding along, and maybe Paul had some understanding of Socrates. I don't know that for sure, but I think that Paul's appealing to somebody different. I think he's appealing to Jesus. Now, on the one hand, you could argue that this is the one attribute of the fruit of the Spirit that's not part of the character of God. So why would God need self-control? God is free. God is loving. God is just. God is not tempted by sin in the same way that we are. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. However... When you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus absolutely was tempted by sin. That doctrine goes, Jesus was 100% God and 100% human being, right? Hebrews says it this way. He says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. So we have to make the assumption if Jesus really was fully 100% human, then Jesus had to exercise some type of self-control over sin. And we see this. Do y'all remember one of the first stories we hear about Jesus? Matthew chapter 4. He has been baptized. God says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And then he, by the Spirit, gets moved out into the wilderness. And what happens there in the wilderness? Well, he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. But who comes up to him? Heaven. Satan comes up to him. And tempts him three different ways. With the bread... With the, with the kingdoms of this world, with the temple. And at each time, how did Jesus respond to him? He responded to him with scripture, actually from Deuteronomy, all three times. All three times. So, so what is that showing us? Well... Well, it's showing us that somehow through Jesus fasting and praying and deep study and knowledge of the scriptures, that Jesus is preventing himself from falling into temptation. Jesus in his prayer that he teaches us to teach, that, uh, to pray, that I think that he probably prayed himself, lead us not into what? Into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus is living this. You look at Jesus last week of his life. 
Somebody's crackling at me. Um, you look at Jesus' last week of life, and, and, and Jesus is, is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is sweating drops of blood, and he prays what? God, if it be your will, let this cup pass over me, but not my what? My will, but your will be done. Right? And so Jesus actually going to the cross was an act of self-control for Jesus. Because he had the power to stop it, yet he does not and gives himself up in sacrificial love for our sins, for my sin, for your sin, for the sin of this world. And on the third day, God rose him from the grave. And through his grace gives us The opportunity for a life of faith. The life of faith living through him. Self-control forms the foundation. Self-control forms the foundation by which the Spirit By which the Spirit produces its fruit in me and in you. Paul says it this way, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I think that's what he's referring to uh, when he's talking about keeping in step with the Spirit, lining up with Spirit. This is, this is self-control language. Uh, Paul has other, other, other words about self-control as well. Uh, over in Titus, Titus chapter 2, he says, teach the older men uh, to be temperate, worthy, respect." Here's our word, self-controlled and sound in faith and love and endurance. Likewise, teach older women to be reverent in the way that they live, to be self-controlled and pure. A little bit later, similarly, to encourage the young men to be self-controlled. All, all age groups here, what's Paul encouraging one of his protégés to do? Teach them to be Self-control, because self-control is the foundation of the, of the, of, by which the Spirit does His work, uh, producing its fruit in our lives. So how does this happen? How does this work? How, how does it form the foundation, and how can we do this? This, is, this feels like an act on our part, and it is just a little bit. So here we go. How do we, how do we create a life of self-control? Number one, you've got to surrender your will daily. You gotta surrender your will daily. Every human being, we're born with a will, a body, and a mind. And here's and here's what here's what happens. The body and the will are in constant fighting with each other. Paul calls it the spirit in the flesh. All right, and so when we are living a life of self-control, the will tells the mind what to do, which then tells the uh, the body what to do. But if you notice, if you're trying to just live by your own will all the time, you're trying to grit your teeth, maybe early in the morning you do really well. But by that time you get to 9 o'clock at night and you hear that ice cream calling you in the freezer. Psychology calls it ego depletion. Which is why we have to surrender our will every day. In the Galatians passage... Uh, right before Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit, he lists the uh, works of the, of the, of the law. And, uh, and, he, and, he, and he says this about it. He says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discourse, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, decisions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, well, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. All of those are bodily desires when our bodily desires are running the show. <laughs> whether it's sexuality, whether it's anger, whether it's gossip, whatever it is, it's usually because our bodily desires are running the show rather than our will submitted to God. Paul has another a way of saying this. This is from Romans 7. I do not understand what I do, for I, 
for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, I am no longer myself who do it, but the sin is living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. I know none of y'all relate to that at all, right? Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but my flesh a slave to the law of sin. Paul uses flesh language. I'm using body language here. Our, our flesh has been corrupted by sin, corrupted in this broken world. And so what does it do? It desires things that aren't made for it. But what happens when we surrender our will? I have a friend in Oklahoma uh, who's been in recovery for 35 years, been sober for 35 years. It's amazing. Uh, really had was hit rock bottom and turned his life around. But it's interesting to me because one day I asked, I said, well, how do you know you won't drink tomorrow? And he said, I don't know that. I said, what do you mean? He said, I don't know that I won't drink tonight. What are you talking about, baby? He said, because it's, I am out of control. My will was out of control. And I have to constantly surrender that back to God. Now, what he did say is over time, it got easier to do that. But it was still an everyday journey with him. So number one, you're going to build a life of self-control. You've got to start with surrender, surrendering your will. Number two, you've got to build holy habits. You've got to build holy habits. Sometimes we call these uh, spiritual disciplines. But all this is is arranging your life so that you are receiving power and love and joy from being in the presence of God. From being in the presence of God. These look like corporate worship. You're doing that here today. These look like personal Bible studies. These look like serving people. Uh, these look like fasting and praying. And, and, and for some of us, this feels really big, right? This feels really hard. Well, let me give you kind of a, some help. If, if you just need some help getting started, do something called habit stacking. All right? I got this from James Clear, a great little book, Atomic Habits. Uh, and then he talks about, so every day, everybody in here, beside what the kids said over here, Y'all all got to brush your teeth, right? I'm hoping so. All right? Maybe put the fruit of the Spirit prayer up on your mirror. And as you're brushing your teeth, you begin to pray that fruit of the Spirit prayer. So in the morning, you wake up. The first thing you do, man, you're in the presence of the triune God. At night, that last thing you do, man, you're in the presence of the triune God. Maybe some of you are like me and you have coffee in the mornings. Go open your Bible next to your coffee maker. And just take some time to read it right there. You're going to make your coffee anyway. Might as well be in the presence of God. You can do that or, or get your dopamine hit on social media. But I think we know which one would do better for us in our life, wouldn't we? There's just different things that you could do. But you want to develop a life of holy habits. And where you're arranging your life to be in rhythm with God. That you're enjoying his presence and receiving power and love constantly from God. And then number three. This is one I don't necessarily like. But you got to embrace your limits. So that you can enjoy God's beauty. Embrace your limits so you can enjoy God's beauty. All right. Barry, I promise I'm not going to do it, okay? What if I went and got Barry's electric guitar? And I turned it around, not on the string side, but on, on the back side. And I tried to play it that way. Could I do that? Well, I could do that. I'm free to do that. But it wouldn't sound very good, would it? Okay, so what if I did turn on the other side, but I know nothing about playing the guitar. I know no chords, I know no scales, I don't know how to pick a guitar, I don't know anything about it. Would it sound very good? 
Probably not, unless I'm a prodigy and I didn't know it. And I can promise you that's not the case. No, but somebody like Barry, who's taken the time and learned the discipline of the chords and the picking, what comes out of that? Beauty. Now, the way I played it was free, free to do it, absolutely free to do it. But it's until I embrace the limits do we get to actually enjoy the beauty that God's created. Self-control is kind of like that. You're embracing your limits. You're embracing the limits that God's placed on you in order to do what? In order to create a life that what comes out is good and true and beautiful. And God's meant for that for you. He's made that life available for you. Abundant life is what Jesus calls it in the, in the gospel of John and self-control, self-control forms that foundation by which the fruit of the Spirit is worked into your life. Here's the thing. The Spirit's going to enable you to do it. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. The more you practice self-control, the easier it becomes and the better you get. It's kind of like compounding interest. I don't know much about investing, but I hear that if you, uh, that with compounding interest, that if you, if you let it alone, you don't do it, but you keep doing it consistently, that interest will build up. The Holy Spirit's doing that in your life when you practice self-control. When you're building those holy habits, when you are surrendering your will, the Holy Spirit is bearing fruit four times, eight times, 20 times, a hundredfold in your life. And one day, one day you'll be able to look back at the end of your life and say, oh my goodness, that was beautiful. Thank you, Lord, for building your fruit in my life. It all starts with self-control. And you could start today. Will you start today building that firm foundation of self-control so that the Spirit of God can work in your life? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Here in a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of response, a song of response. And maybe some of you all have never responded to the work of Jesus. I want to invite you today to receive Jesus as Lord, to be baptized. Maybe some of you in here, this is the church you want to journey with. I invite you to come forward. I'd love to pray with you and talk with you about that. So others of you here... The Holy Spirit's working in your life here today. And you need somebody to pray for you. Somebody else is looking around, but if that's you, would you just look at me? Here. 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 Let's spend some time in prayer. Our God, how grateful we are to be here. How grateful we are be among your people, how grateful we are for your love and grace. God, I pray that we'll be a people of self-control, a people of forgiveness, a people of love. I pray for my brothers and sisters in here who, who are looking at me today. You know what they need. I pray that you'll come alongside. Give them the strength and grace and joy that they need in their lives. And I pray, God, that if anybody needs to make a decision today, that you'd give them the courage to do it. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, however it is you need to respond.
I pray that you do so as we stand and sing. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. y'all be seated for just one moment. We have one more announcement. Turn over to Miss Martha. Because I do know that we have some visitors uh, in the crowd, let me just hasten to say that when I mention the name Ray, I'm talking about my Ray, my husband, not Pastor Ray, okay? So... <laughs> It was almost 40 years ago that I walked into this sanctuary for the first time. I was young and full of energy, ready to work hard. Well, I am no longer young, and energy often eludes me. So as difficult as this is, I want to let you know that I will be retiring from my position as minister to preschoolers and children as of December 31st of this year. While this has not been an easy decision, it is, it is a decision that I know is right. Creevewood is home to Ray and me. We were married here. Granted, the sanctuary didn't look quite this lovely. The old timers will know what I mean by that. We dedicated ourselves to raising our son Kyle in a Christian home in this very room. And Kyle was baptized here. There are so many memories of various experiences. And then there are the many people who have enriched our lives throughout the years. Words are inadequate to express my thanks for the ways in which Creevewood has shown love to me and my family. And I'll just have to say, I grew up in a pastor's home. I've been a part of many churches, uh, and I have never seen one that has poured out love 
like this church. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, the journey has not always been easy, but it has definitely been fulfilling. And the greatest aspect of all is the sustaining grace of God that has been with me for every moment. Through the highs and lows of ministry, even when I was the only non-interim ministerial staff member left, I felt God's strength and power in a mighty way. And I might add uh, just a personal word that uh, my husband Ray has been the most supportive spouse a minister could have ever had. There were many times when I just had to hand Kyle off to him and say, got to go to the funeral home, got to go to the hospital, got to go here, got to go to a meeting was a big one. And uh, took him every time. He's worked in this church. He's loved this church. And I'm very grateful for him. One other aspect of my retirement, uh, here's the harder part, is that Ray and I will be moving to Washington, Georgia. We have been spending our vacations in Washington for many years and have come to love the small town feel that the town provides. We have a longtime friend there, and both Ray and I have family in Georgia as well. So I hope in the next few weeks I will have the opportunity to talk with you individually and express to you how much you mean to me and my family. My prayer is that Crevewood will continue to seek God's will for ministry in the Creve Hall community and beyond. While we do not specifically know how that, uh, all that he has planned for Crevewood will be accomplished, we do know that God has a plan. So I leave you with these words from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that it works in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Y'all would do me a favor and extend your hands toward Martha. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.